Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Amanda, and I'm coming to you live from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And I'm so excited you decided to join us today as we explore and learn a little bit more about some very interesting animals in the ocean. But before we dive in, I'd like to invite you to join us. And if you have any questions, you can text them in, and you'll see a number appearing at the bottom of the screen. You can text in your questions to 562-286-1838 or any comments that you have about the class along as we go if you'd like to participate with us. And we would love to hear from you. Now, of course, children, make sure you have your parents' permission before you text as text messaging rates may apply. Uh, but also, if you are watching this at a later time, you can also still email us your questions at live at LB for Long Beach, AOP, Aquarium of Pacific, org. So live at lbaop.org if you are watching this at a later time and you'd still like to ask us your questions and communicate with us because we are here and we would love to hear from you. Uh, so let's dive on in today and talk about invertebrates. Now, when people think about animals in the ocean, a lot of times people have favorite animals. They say, oh, I love whales and dolphins and that's true, that's one of my favorites too. Uh, or they say, oh, I love sharks. Oh, I love sea turtles or penguins. But how many times have you ever heard somebody say, I love invertebrates? Yeah, it's not one of those normal things you hear, is it? Uh, but maybe you're not even sure what an invertebrate is. I'm sure a number of you know, but let's go back a little bit, take a step back and talk about what is an invertebrate, the word invertebrate. Well, an invertebrate is simply an animal that doesn't have vertebrae. Well, wait a minute. Let's go back to that word, vertebrae. Well, I have a little model here that I can use to help me out. It's missing a few bones, but this is our little model of, what do you think it is? It's not a snake, <laughs> no, but this is a model of the backbone. Now, when we say backbone, Oftentimes we say it as it's one big long bone, but you have to realize your backbone is made up of a bunch of little tiny bones called vertebrae. So these individual bones here, and you can actually check them if you reach behind your back and you feel all those bumps going up and down the middle of your back, each one of those little bumps that you feel is one little bone called a vertebra. And when you have more than one vertebra, you have vertebrae. So this is your collection of vertebrae that make up your backbone. So again, keeping in mind our own backbone is more than just one bone. It's several of these vertebrae. So any animal that has vertebrae like this is what we call a vertebrate. So are you a vertebrate? Absolutely. We have vertebrae. We are vertebrates. Well, then what do you think an invertebrate would be? Well... Honestly, it would be an animal that doesn't have any vertebrae. So thinking about how we would survive without a backbone, obviously we couldn't. Uh, we have other special characteristics or adaptations that help us to survive um, in addition to our backbone. But think about the animals that don't have backbones. Obviously, they need some extra special adaptations to help them survive. Now we have a nice little picture right behind us of some invertebrates. And I'm sure you recognize what these are, and somebody was already asking a question about them. Uh, these right here are our sea nettles, which are a type of sea jelly. Notice I didn't say jellyfish, because a fish is an animal with, you guessed it, vertebrae. So I have my little model here. You can see it has a spine. It has all these little backbones. It's got bones inside of its body. So it's a vertebrate. And obviously these sea jellies are not. You can see right through them and you can't see any bones. All right, well, we have a couple questions coming in. So Alexa asked, are jellyfish or sea jellies invertebrates? And we've just answered that question. Yes, they are. And also Olivia asked, do inverts, invertebrates, bleed? Ooh, that's a good question. It kind of depends on the type of invertebrate that it is. Because for something to bleed, it has to have blood flowing through its body. Now these jellies right here, they actually wouldn't bleed if they were cut. They don't have a circulatory system. They don't even have a heart. They don't have a need for a heart to pump uh, blood through their system because they actually get everything they need right straight from their tissues and they don't have a system that goes through their whole body. So no blood, so no jellies. Now there are some other animals uh, that do have blood, some other invertebrates, and so they could bleed if they were cut. 
But that's a really good and interesting question I honestly hadn't thought about before. So thanks, Olivia, for bringing that up. All right, so as we look at these invertebrates, you can probably find some other adaptations that they have that help them to survive in their habitat. And as you watch them as they're moving, they move a little bit differently than animals that have bones. Now they do have a special nerve net that does allow them to move and, you know, just like you're seeing here, and also to capture their prey. Now we move with a brain is sending signals to the rest of our body to move. The jellies don't even have a brain. Kind of weird, huh? So no brain and no heart and yet, and no backbone, but yet they're still animals that survive uh, in their habitat. They move very slowly through these nerve impulses, uh, but this nerve net, but not a central command center of a brain to help them move. And when something brushes up against those tentacles, do you know what happens? Absolutely. They can grab their food or whatever it is that touches them, and they can sting them with special little stinging cells inside. And that's how they're able to grab their food without even having to think about it. It's an automatic response when something brushes up against the trigger of their stinging cell. It can grab it and then pull it on up to where their stomachs are. So a sea jelly, I think you would agree with me, is a pretty amazing invertebrate. But I also have some other invertebrates. I want to show you a picture. I have, I grabbed a few different things that we have around the aquarium and I put them over here on my special camera. And I want you to look at this and tell me what comes to your mind when you look at these items that I have over here. So if I was to ask you, what are these animals? What would you say? Obviously they're not all the same thing, but are there things that they have in common? I'm kind of curious to know what you think. Is there some sort of common commonality between all these different organisms? Or even think about, well, where would you find them? What, what is the word that comes to mind? So we'll wait and see if anyone has any um, input for it but, or any insight, but look at how different and how similar some of these look compared to each other. We definitely have some more questions coming in. And so since we were, we're getting away from jellies, but we'll go ahead and answer the questions because I know we have a little bit of a delay here. Someone asked, what animals eat jellies? Oh, that's a great question. We might even be able to bring up on the screen an example of some of the animals that eat jellies. I think we might even have two of the ones that come to my mind. We might have a picture of here. So this is probably the most popular one that people are familiar with. Sea turtles love to eat sea jellies. And they actually have, let me try to move off to the side so you can see his, his mouth a little bit better. Uh, they have these special crazy looking throats that if you were to look inside the throat of a sea turtle, they have these little projections that stick out. They almost look like little thorns inside their throat. And they're able to eat sea jellies and not be stung. And it's pretty crazy. Uh, but they don't get affected by the sea jellies. Now there's another animal that's also actually pretty large. It happens to be the largest fish, largest bony fish in the ocean. And it's called the mola mola or the ocean sunfish. It's also another fish, uh, another organism that eats sea jelly. So I don't know if we have a picture of that. Ah, we do. Yay, Stacy, my friend in the studio found it for me. So here we have the ocean sunfish and it's even kind of hard to see where its mouth is, but it's right up there. It's a very strange, peculiar looking animal, but it is a vertebrate that eats sea jelly. So good question. And that came from, oh, actually, I don't know who that came from. But we also have a question from Bella that says, what is the difference between sea jellies and jellyfish? I'm so glad you asked that. Um, let me make it a little bit clearer because it is kind of confusing because we say sea jellies and jellyfish. A jellyfish and a sea jelly are the same thing. The reason we here at the Aquarium of the Pacific call them sea jellies is because they're technically not fish. So that's why we don't say jellyfish because they don't have bones. Remember we established that all uh, fish have vertebrae of some sort, whether it's made out of bone or made out of cartilage, they are still considered vertebrates. So sea jellies are not vertebrates, they're invertebrates. They also don't have fins like fish have. They don't have scales like fish. Uh, so they are very different. So completely different organisms. And just to kind of keep us straight in our minds, that's why we call it a sea jelly rather than a jellyfish. But the two words were referring to the same type of animal. All right, great question. And then Natalie wants to know how small can a jellyfish be or a sea jelly? Well, they can be really tiny. I don't know if 
what the smallest picture we have of a sea jelly is. But when you see a jelly like this, now also keep in mind, I'll also answer the question of how large sea jellies can get. Uh, sea jellies, the largest one is the lion's mane sea jelly. It can get up to 100 feet long. Its tentacles are huge and its bell can be somewhere around eight feet in diameter, maybe even bigger than that. Uh, so very, very large. And oh, I'm sorry, I said bell. I should probably define what that means. If you look at this example of this jelly here, this little stuffed plushy, uh, this part right here is called a bell. And if I go like that, you can probably figure out why a scientist may have come up with that tricky name. Uh, so the bell of the jelly is up here, and these are their tentacles that are hanging down. Uh, this is a crystal jelly here, and they are pretty small. Uh, the ones we have that, well, I've seen regular full-grown jellies about this big, and I'm trying to think if those, those were umbrella jellies. Maybe my friends in the studio can help me out. But we do have some very adult-sized jellies that are like this size. They're not very big. These also are pretty small jellies. Now, when they start off life, they start off even smaller. So tiny. In fact, they don't even look like this at all. Instead of floating around like this, they actually kind of start off life upside down, kind of like a sea anemone does. And so they have what's called a polyp. And here's a picture of a sea anemone. So you can see a sea anemone is stuck to the rock down here, and then it grows up this way and has all of these tentacles sticking up. So all of these white tentacles, and then their mouth is right there in the center. Well, a sea jelly, when it starts off life, when, it's, when the fertilized egg lands and it starts to grow, once it finds a rock to attach to, then it can grow up. And as it grows, it kind of branches out and looks kind of like a little anemone like this. And then one by one, it goes through this phase where these little jellies, little tiny baby jellies, kind of upside down, start popping off. It's almost like a big stack of Dixie cups or little uh, cups all stacked on top of each other. And then one by one, you start picking them off and they start floating around the ocean. Um, and those are called ephyra. And then when they get a little bit bigger than this, those ephyra, they turn into the adult stage of the jelly that we're used to seeing. Uh, so Here's a moon jelly, and we actually have these at the Aquarium of the Pacific that you can touch. Believe it or not, this is a sea jelly. We allow our guests to touch because it will not hurt them. We obviously would never allow our guests to touch something that would hurt them. But you can touch them gently on the top of this bell. They have no stinging cells there, and even the stinging cells that they have are not very strong because they only use them for catching plankton. So different types of jellies eat different types of food. Moon jellies eat very, very small food and they don't need a very strong sting. And plus, they've got very, very short tentacles. You can barely even see them here in this picture. Okay, and then Brayden wants to know, are jellyfish dangerous? So some sea jellies are dangerous. Uh, you do, I, in fact, I would never encourage you if you see a sea jelly to ever touch one uh, because even if you think, oh, I'm just going to touch them on the top. I heard in some movie, if you touch them on the top, you won't get stung. And while that's not where their tentacles grow, and the tentacles are the parts with the stinging cells, it's possible, who knows, maybe there's a tentacle up there that you didn't even see, and you touch that jelly, you could get stung. So even if you see one washed up on the beach, please do not touch it. It's not a good idea. It's better to be safe than sorry. Most of the time, a jelly would just be a very unpleasant, painful sting. Uh, but there are cases that it could be life-threatening. Uh, not the moon jelly here, though. That's not something you would have to worry about. Uh, and so are sea jellies poisonous, Natalie wants to know. So jellies, they don't, let's talk, let me also introduce two different words to you. The word poison and the word venom. Now poison is something that's ingested. Something that you swallow would be poisonous to you. So unless you're planning on eating a jelly, it wouldn't really be poisonous. Now other organisms that can sting you or can bite you and have a way of injecting you with those toxins, that's considered venom. So a snake, for example, would be what you would call venomous rather than poisonous, unless you're eating the snake, of course. Uh, and so a sea jelly, if you think about it, if it's floating and you're touching it and you get stung by it, would that be considered poisonous or would that be venomous? It would be venomous. So yes, many sea jellies have a venomous sting. They have the ability to sting you, uh, but not all of them. Um, there's varying degrees of how that would feel. Uh, Lara wants to know, explain the sting a little more. Venom or electrical? Ooh. 
Well, you know what? There probably are different methods with different species. And I don't know for sure, but my basic understanding of how the sting works is most of the time it's more of a mechanical thing. When something brushes up against it, it causes that, now that could be electrical in there too, uh, but it causes that stinging cell to shoot out and attach onto the object or the prey that it's trying to get. Uh, so you're not going to necessarily get an electric shock. So there might be electrical impulses happening, but it's not an electric shock that you would get. Um, but it would be a very painful experience as something shoots into your skin. So hopefully that kind of clears things up a little bit. Uh, do stingrays have a backbone? Oh, Sophia, great question. Uh, do stingrays have a backbone? Well, they are vertebrates, believe it or not. But stingrays and sharks are kind of this different group of animals that don't have bones. <laughs> So they are vertebrates, but they're not vertebrates with bones. They're vertebrates with cartilage instead. So yes, they are vertebrates, but a little bit different. They have a backbone, but it's just not made out of bone. And then Brayden wants to know, do their tentacles ever get, oh, do they ever get tangled? Yeah, so if we go back to our live feed of our jelly webcam, uh, you'll notice if you see a whole bunch of jellies all together and they've got all these tentacles um, you know, hanging out all around each other. Because keeping in mind, these animals are what we would consider plankton that just kind of float around with the ocean, wherever the ocean current takes them. And so those tentacles can be just floating around, even within the same jelly, it almost looks like they're not always just going straight out. So there, you can see how easily it could get tangled in here. And yes, occasionally they do get tangled up. And our staff, our aquarists have to go in and untangle the sea jellies. Uh, but fortunately it doesn't happen too often and they're still pretty free to float throughout the water and enjoy their, enjoy as much as you can without a brain, uh, their environment, their habitat that they're in. All right, so let's see. I wanna get back to our picture uh, that we were looking at earlier. Let's go back to the camera. Did you come up with any ideas? What kinds of things do you think of? I know a lot of times when people look at all of this stuff, they think, oh my goodness, seashells those are shells and people think well yeah it's a seashell right it's just magically made by the beach but one thing i'd like everyone to learn today is that when you see a shell on the beach it does not magically appear on the beach it is made by an animal so the question is what kind of animal made that shell and when you look at the animals that i have here uh or what's left of the animals that we have here. None of these are alive, don't worry. Uh, we have different types of animals. Are there some up here that you recognize? I'm kind of curious to know if there are any that you recognize being up here because there are a number of different animals, but there's something that many of them have in common. Many of them have shells and many of them are what we call mollusks. So mollusks are animals that have a soft body, but a hard shell, um, or most of them have a hard shell. There are few exceptions to this, uh, but those are mollusks. But not everything up here is a mollusk. We also have a cnidarian. A cnidarian is just like what you were looking at. So remember the sea jellies floating around and I said they have stinging cells? Well, the stinging cells are called nematocysts. They're also called nidae. And it begins, it's a really strange sounding word, but it begins with a C and not an N. It's a <laughs> C-N, it's a silent C, it's kind of interesting. Uh, but these stinging cells, these cnidarians, C-N-I, uh, these cnidarians, this one right here is a coral. And corals are relatives of sea jellies because they also have stinging cells. Now, in fact, since we're talking about it, let me take, see if I can get a closer view of our sea, of our coral here, I should say. Now, do you see all those little individual little holes in there? Each one of those holes is where one coral polyp, and remember I talked about that word earlier, polyp, P-O-L-Y-P. A polyp is that kind of sea anemone looking animal. The sea anemone also is that stage of its life. It's called a polyp as well. And so imagine a whole bunch of little teeny tiny sea anemone type creatures all living in that area. So a coral, this one piece, was home to hundreds of different individual coral animals, all living together with this shared, in the shared community where they kind of share their food and things like that. Um, 
So this is considered an invertebrate. It doesn't have a regular skeleton. I, I mentioned, you know, we say that they have a hard skeleton, but it's not made out of bone. Um, it's a little bit different. So not individual bones, but it does have this uh, structure underneath it. And this is what makes up the coral reef structures. Now, so this is on Cnidaria. Now I also have this animal here. You probably recognize this. This is a sea star. So again, not a starfish because it's not really a fish. So just like the sea jellies, this is a sea star. Of course, if you say starfish, you're talking about the same animal. But there's also another relative of the sea star here, which is not a mollusk. And a sea star is what we call an echinoderm. Echinoderm is another strange sounding word, but here is another echinoderm cousin. Now, you may not have seen this before. It might not, might not look that familiar to you, but this is the inside shell of another animal that my friend Stacy will probably be able to show you. Yeah, does that look familiar now? So this animal right here is a sea urchin, and it's got these long pointy spines all over its body. And it's also got these little teeny tube feet. It's kind of hard to tell, but if you look really, really carefully, you might even be able to see, well, maybe not, uh, these little um, like purple-like hairs that they kind of wave in between their spines that they use to help them move and also to help them breathe. And if I come back to my camera, you can see where each one of those purple spines was attached. So each one of those bumps, those little circles there, is where one of those long purple spines was attached. So this, again, is an echinoderm like the sea star. One thing about sea stars is they have this kind of five parts, these five arms. Most sea stars do. Some, of course, have more. Um, some have less. But they usually have about a five part, kind of a, what we call radial symmetry. So it's kind of like a pizza. You can slice it in different directions. Um, and you can do that kind of like with this as well, because if we were to look on the underside, this would be where the sea urchin's mouth would have been. Its mouth would have been right here on the underside. They have five little teeth that they use for crunching up that uh, kelp, like you were looking at in the picture. And they have, guess how many teeth? Five. So they have five teeth, just like the five parts of this uh, star. Now also notice this animal right here. Now, you might not have thought that this was an animal at all. Again, were you thinking, oh, that's just a seashell? <laughs> well, take a look. Do you notice anything that reminds you of a sea star? Let it focus. Ah, do you see how it has those five parts, too? They look like little flower petals, kind of. Well, does anyone know what this animal is? I'm actually going to wait because this is one of my favorite ones to talk about. And I'm going to see if there's anyone else who can text in and tell me what type of animal that was that I was holding. So what is this animal here? And there's actually different, uh, different kinds of this particular animal. Um, this one happens to have a hole right in the middle of it. Some others of this um, kind of animal have little holes on the end called lunules. And then we also have others which are found here in Southern California uh, that are actually all one big circle and they're kind of solid. And I'll show you what they look like. Here's a picture, and I'm actually going to bring it over to my camera so you can see it a little bit better. But see those round purple things? Ah, somebody guessed sand dollar. Good job. You're absolutely correct. So these are sand dollars, but look at how different they look. Now, again, these are two different. The picture that you see here, this purple one, is called the Western sand dollar. Um, oh, it's kind of can't really see all the detail with the with the lights kind of bright for it uh, but if I hold it here you can see there are some differences uh, because these don't have those little um, oh, little spots in it like that it doesn't have that hole in the center but what you're looking at here in this picture is the underside of the sand dollar so this part right here now what is the big difference between the ones in this picture and the one I'm holding in my hand What would you guys say is the big difference? Besides the fact that this one has a hole in it, what about the color? Yeah, the color is white on this one and purple on the other ones. Do you remember the other purple animal that we saw, the other purple invertebrate? Yeah, the sea urchin. So sea urchins are animals, even though they look like big fuzzy balls, and sand dollars are animals as well. So remember the big purple spines all over the sea urchin? 
Well, this is an echinoderm. This is also an echinoderm. A sand dollar is actually a flattened out sea urchin. So all those purple spines that are long on the sea urchin, if we just shorten them and shrink them and make them a lot smaller, you can actually see them right here in this picture. They've got little purple spines all over their bodies. Do you see them right here? And then they also have tube feet. So when I was showing you this picture and we were looking, or this um, sand dollar example I have, when we were looking at these little petal-like things, those are where some special tube feet that they have grow. And they reach up and they help the animal to breathe. So they breathe through their feet, which is also true of our other echinoderm, the sand, oh, I'm sorry, not the sand, the sea star right here. So sea stars also have tube feet on the underside of their bodies that they use for breathing and also for walking around. So here's um, a little model that I have of the sea star. And he's got on the underside, this is where all of his tube feet would be growing. So all in here, they can move with those feet. They can also breathe with them. And the most amazing thing is the last one on each arm has the ability to see. Now, their sight is not as good as our sight. They don't necessarily see like faces and things like that, but they can tell where it's light and when it's dark. Or if it's an object that isn't moving, they can actually kind of focus on it a little bit. Uh, so really amazing animals. Again, no bones. Now, if you compare it to these animals here, these are also sea stars. These are what we call bat stars. And they're called bat stars because if you do look at them, they have this sort of webbing. It looks like there's webbing between their arms, uh, just like the wings of a bat. So that's why they're referred to as bat stars. So that's a bat star. This one would be what we call an ochre sea star, um, a little bit different shape, much longer, skinnier arms, uh, but both sea stars and pretty interesting animals, if you ask me. Now, I still want to go back to my favorite one here, the sand dollar. So when you look at the sand dollar, remember I said you're looking at the underside of the sand dollar in this picture. So you don't see the pretty petals that we were looking at earlier, but you're looking at them kind of on this side. So if I put this right here, in the underside of my sand dollar, do you see these long grooves? What do you think those are for? Hmm. Well, where did we say the mouth was? Right there in the center. Do you see it? So that's where their mouth is. So they have a very interesting way of getting their food. Sand dollars, especially like the Western sand dollar here, will actually orient themselves up in the water like this. So they're kind of sticking up and they will allow, actually the Western sand dollar is a little bit different because it will reach out its tube feet so all the tube feet on that flat part, the oral side of the sand dollar, they'll reach out and they'll grab plankton from the water. And when they grab plankton, they bring it in. And the way that they eat, I think is amazing. My hair is getting caught here. Uh, the way that they eat, they actually will take their food and they'll even use their little spines to kind of close in around it. And they have these little pincher things in between their spines that will kind of crunch up their food and then they wrap it in this big ball of mucus, like snot, and then they send it down these little roadways that lead to their mouth. So these little grooves, these oral grooves that you see are the pathways that the food takes to get to the mouth of the sand dollar. And when they're sitting up like this, it would be really easy for a big wave to come and knock them over, right? But having those holes will allow the water to go through. And the other thing that Western sand dollars will do is they'll actually swallow some sand to help weigh them down to make them a little bit heavier so that they're not, not knocked over as easily. Well, I realize I've been talking a long time and you have a lot of questions. So let me go ahead and get to those questions. Uh, okay, so let me make sure, what ones have I not? Oh, Bella also asked, how many species of jellies are there? Um, I actually don't know. <laughs> so if thousands and thousands. Uh, this is one of the coolest jellies here. This one's called a flower hat jelly and it has the ability to fluoresce. It has these beautiful colors on it uh, that in the right lighting look absolutely gorgeous. Um, I don't know if they have bioluminescent ability. I think it's only the fluorescence, uh, but yeah, really cool. They look like a very fancy uh, flowered hat. 
Uh, and then do you have glow in the dark sea jellies? Oh, okay, also from Bella. So this is a good example of one that kind of glows in the dark. Now, I also want to point out we have an animal at the aquarium called the comb jelly. And many times people will look at this animal. I don't think we have a picture of it. Uh, but if you've ever seen a jelly that looks like it's got rainbow colors going all up and down it, uh, they're beautiful to look at. If you get a chance, look up comb jellies, um, C-O-M-B, like a comb for your hair. And they're not actually lighting up. Even though they look bright and colorful, all they're doing is they're taking the light that's around them and they're refracting it. They're bending it. So it gives you almost like looking through a prism and a prism will break up the different colors of the wavelengths of light that are hitting it. So you can see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, all those colors of the rainbow. Well, that's what the comb jelly does. It has these little things called cilia that look like little hairs. And as they move them, it changes the way that the light is hitting them coming to our eyes. So we see all these beautiful colors. But if you were to make that exhibit all dark and look inside of it, you wouldn't see any light coming from it. So there needs to be another source of light. So they're not actually producing it themselves. But really good question. Um, Amora wants to know, can sea stars stick? Oh, absolutely. And how long can they stick? Another good question. Uh, so on the underside of their arms, they have those two feet. So those two feet not only are good for helping them move and breathe and see, but they also to help them stick. So here you can see these sea stars that are, mm, all the way, oh, perfect. Here's a perfect example because these are, this picture was taken through a window and you can see that the sea stars are hanging on to the windows with their two feet. So this is what it looks like when it's alive. Oops, I'm tracing, having a hard time tracing. Uh, but in that groove where the feet are, you can see hundreds of tube feet. And I know that's kind of a strange word to say too, tube, T-U-B-E. So not two like we've got two feet, not the number two, but tube feet because they're like tubes that have water. They send water into their tube feet to help them stretch out and pull back and to help them move and to stick. So interesting question. And how long? As long as they want to. Sea stars are very stubborn animals. If you ever see a sea star somewhere, do not try to be cute and pick it up and stick it on your face because they will probably stay on your face and not want to let go. And if you try to pull that sea star off your face, don't worry, I'm not speaking from experience. Uh, but I've heard some interesting stories. Uh, they will probably, they are so stubborn that you would probably end up breaking off all of their tube feet before you would get them to actually let go of you. So you'd have all these tube feet stuck on you. So they do stick very, very well. Uh, so if you see a sea star, probably just let him be. Okay, um, more questions. Melody wants to know, does a chitin move? Oh my goodness, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I'm sure a number of other people are wondering, what is a chitin? Let's go back to my uh, picture over here, my camera. And this right here is from a chitin. So a chitin, I never got to really explain what all of these other animals had in common. Besides the fact that we have uh, a cnidarian, we have echinoderms, right? These three are echinoderms. But all of these other ones are mollusks, those soft-bodied animals, and they're not just seashells. They're all made by animals. And this type is from a chitin. A chitin is, I guess in a way, kind of like a snail with a really strong ability to stick. So they have this body underneath them that's a little bit softer, right, that would live underneath here, and they can stick really well to rocks. Um, this also is a limpet, and it's very similar to the chitin. It's very good at sticking to things. You can always identify a limpet because they have this oval-shaped shell that kind of comes up like a little, um, like a, a little pyramid, but at the very top of the shell, they have this opening, and that's what they use for um, all the waste. <laughs> that's where all the waste comes out. It comes out off the top of their shell, but these are kind of like snails. And so now I forgot, you mentioned chitin, but I forgot what the main question about the chitin was. Oh, how they move. Yes, they can move and they can stick. They have a foot that they move along, um, but they kind of suction into place and they stick in one spot for a long time. You don't see them move as much as you do some other animals. And while we're on it, I also want to mention this amazing animal here. This is what's called an abalone. An abalone is another type of snail for the most part. It's a snail that lives underneath this hard shell 
It has these holes in its shell, and it has a beautiful underside of its shell where the animal and the muscles are attached. So this is a snail that moves along the bottom of the ocean. Um, depending on the type of abalone it is, you might see black uh, little sensory tentacles sticking out all around the edges, or you might see white ones. We're hoping that we start to see more of the white abalone. Uh, we actually just helped release a number of white abalone out into the ocean off our coast, where, which we're very, very excited about. Our team of aquarists, of aquarists had been working with um, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and some other partner organizations to raise and grow and release white abalone uh, back out into the ocean because they were actually the first marine invertebrate to be put on the endangered species list. And we are really excited to be able to um, help them to grow and maybe live in our waters again uh, because they were almost wiped out. All right. Um, I know we are out of time, but I still wanted to see what, what questions I'm missing. Um, we got those. Can sea stars stick? Does a chitin move? Yes, a chitin moves. Dash says, how do you untangle a sea jelly? Uh, very carefully. <laughs> um, I believe most of them use gloves of some sort when they are in this tangling, detangling process. Fortunately, I've never had to be a part of it. Uh, but our husbandry staff, um, that's something that they've had to deal with. And what is your favorite animal at the aquarium? You know what, honestly, my favorite one is probably the sand dollars because I love talking about them because people don't understand them. They think they're just magically made by the ocean. They don't realize they're living animals with such amazing adaptations to help them move and eat and survive. Um, I also like though our mammals are pretty cute and sea dragons are cool. I could go on, uh, but I do like the sand dollars. Uh, and that was from Amora. Bryson said, what is the white stuff hanging off the sea jelly? Uh, so as far as this example goes, you're probably looking at a picture. But the things that would be hanging off a sea jelly, on the outside edges, these would be the parts that we would call the tentacles. And the pus, what's that? The, oh, the tag. Yeah, it's the tag. <laughs> My flesh jelly. <laughs> so if that is what you were wondering about, that's what it is. Um, otherwise, these things in the middle that hang down are called the oral arms. So these long things in the middle are the oral arms, the mouth arms of the sea jelly. And the tentacles of the moon jelly are actually very, very small. And they're, they almost look like long eyelashes all around the outside edge of the bell. So I hope I answered that question. Maybe you were just wondering about the tag. Uh, and then Reagan says, why do jellies sting? And they do that for self-defense and also to help them eat their food, uh, to make sure things aren't eating them and to help them get the food that they need. Uh, Norma said, is there an animal that can't eat sea jellies? Um, probably most animals can't eat sea jellies, um, unless they had it cooked and prepared in some special way, because believe it or not, people can sometimes eat sea jellies. Um, I've actually had a sample of sea jellies before, but not the tentacles. I don't think those are the part that, that we're eating because that wouldn't, I don't think I'd want to take a risk of putting something that could sting me inside my body. Uh, but most animals can't. There are only few that can, like the sea, uh, sea turtle and um, mola mola. And somewhat recently I discovered a new animal and I can't, I can't remember now what it was, but there is another animal uh, that we found out can also eat sea jelly. So maybe that would be a good Google search for you to do. Okay, well, I know we are way out of time. Uh, thank you so much for hanging with me, though, and, and joining us for this, here, I'll stand on this side so you can see the jellies, uh, for another edition of Aquarium Online Academy. Uh, again, if you have any questions or if you've been watching this and you would like to, um, watching this at a later date, and email your questions, we can respond to you with, if you email to, whoops, live at lbaop.org. Uh, because we would love to hear from you. And be sure to check out our website. We are happy to um, provide lots of resources uh, for you. We have webcams to look into our exhibits, just like this one here, uh, and all sorts of cool things that you can check out if you have a little bit of free time on your hands, which a lot of us do these days. So have a wonderful day. Thanks again for joining us. And in another half hour, well, 20 minutes, we'll be doing a squid dissection. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>